the Peregrine Dame this time. Welcome to Tacloban. I'm Rachel Parsons, and I travel alone all over the world to show you that traveling solo doesn't have to be so scary. And being alone doesn't mean you're lonely. So come on, don't wait for anyone to go with. The world is not going to wait for you. Don't be afraid. Coagulated pig's blood. Ah. Don't be afraid. Be a peregrine dame. November 2013, Typhoon Haiyan, known here in the Philippines as Yolanda, made landfall out of the Pacific in this region. I watched with the rest of the world as storm surges destroyed Tacloban, killing more than 6,000 people. A little more than a year later, Ruby came through and blasted the area again. Although thanks to early evacuations and a weaker storm front, only a handful of lives were lost. Because I know how easy it can be for a disaster to leave the news cycle and be forgotten, I've come here, alone, as usual, out of sheer curiosity to see for myself the progress that's been made. I've decided to make camp at the Z-Pad residences on the edge of Tacloban City Center. At about $30 a night for what's advertised as a mini room, it's on the high end of the budget options for the area. It may not be the cheapest in Tacloban, but it's definitely one of the smallest. But hey, it's newly redone and clean. Could be worse. I got a bigger room, but it took my shower in the tiny, in the uh, mini that I had originally booked flooding to do it. So, so there you go. That's how you get an upgrade. I'm not here to stay inside a hotel room anyway. I was told once upon a time that Tacloban was a sleepy little town. And it was. But in just the past 40 years, the population of this provincial capital has nearly tripled to more than 220,000 people. I watched the news like everyone else around the world when Yolanda hit and when Ruby hit a year later, and I didn't see much footage of downtown Tacloban. We saw, uh, you know, the shanty towns along the water's edge that were blown away. We saw the devastation, but uh, downtown Tacloban is hopping. It's incredible. I was expecting a sleepy little backwater, I think, when I was doing my research and coming through here, and that's not what this is. It's that sheer number of people that, when combined with the extreme poverty, contributed to the high death toll during the typhoon in 2013. I get the feeling that Tacloban City wasn't in the best shape before Hurricane Yolanda. One block, you'll see a building that looks like this. And the next, you'll see a building that looks like this. And I have no way of knowing what was due to hurricane damage and what was just neglect. And then there's the obvious influence of politics and religion in this predominantly Catholic country. It's hard to know for sure, but whether it was just a matter of course or due to the Pope's recent visit, all of the churches, of course, and the legislative and governmental offices here for the city and the region are in pretty darn good shape, if not pristine. While many people live in conditions like this. Yes, it's filthy and it's poor. But when you find a quiet street like this where people are just living their lives at dusk, it's beautiful twilight, it actually has some charm. And there's barbecue everywhere. Pardon my chicken. Just eat the street food. I got two pieces of barbecue chicken on sticks. It didn't even cost me a dollar. And I've got enough protein to last me half the day. Don't be afraid. Oh, hadn't killed me yet. And I need the sustenance because things are about to get heavy. This is Barangay 70, one of the stretches that was hardest hit when the typhoon made landfall. But there were many stretches. The city of Tacloban is on a peninsula. Because of its geography, the storm surge from Yolanda wrapped around it and came at the town from three sides. That surge was the height of a two-story building. This barangay, or neighborhood, was made famous when these images of grounded ships hit the international news. But what strikes me more immediately is the welcoming party. I suddenly have an entourage. I've heard conflicting stories from people. Some of the kids say locals wanted the ship to stay as a reminder. Some of the adults said no. 
I'm not quite sure something isn't been lost in translation. I've had a couple of other people closer into downtown Tacloban tell me that yes, uh, some of the barangays, the local village leaders here, uh, did ask for one or two of these holes to stay here. And now people are making the best of it. This particular one, people have moved in and are using it as homes and shelter. But it's a powerful symbol of the destruction. After Yolanda, much of the city's coastline was declared a no-build zone. But Barangay 70 doesn't fall into that category, so people got to work rebuilding as soon as they could, and are still. You live here? Yes. Okay. And your family rebuilt? Yes. You were affected by the storm? I have uh, five, uh, five family. My mother and my youngest sister was died after that typhoon in Manila. You chose to rebuild here? Yeah, maybe. Yes. Okay. Why did you not move? Because here in, in Tacloban was born in... Born. And my father said, no living here because my mother and youngest sister does was a memory. You still feel like it's home? Yeah. It's hard coming here. It's hard whipping out a camera and asking people very hard questions about their life. But, um, I want to make sure that what I'm doing isn't exploitative, but I also came here to shoot a story. So I'm trying to tread lightly and be conscious of the fact that that these are human beings. And there's the crux. When you run into other Caucasians around here, they're either media or working with NGOs. That group, I don't know. Quite frankly, I don't have the time to stop and ask. So all I can guess is that that's a tourist group. Which begs the question, is our presence here helpful? Hopefully we're spending money in the right places. We're making sure the local economy is being boosted. I would hate to think it's the other way around and, uh, and that none of the money is really seeing these people. We're just showing up, taking pictures and leaving and, and forgetting about the place. Those people may well be fresh NGO volunteers, and I know I'm not the only traveler sensitive to this situation, but when I see groups like this, I still have my own biased, knee-jerk reaction to what I perceive as a cheap photo op. <laughs> Despite its looks, Barangay 70 is actually in pretty good shape, but I still want to know which ones aren't and which groups are working on those spots. So I'm heading to Naning, a bar in downtown Tacloban where I hear locals mix with a lot of NGO volunteers and aid workers. Naning is a bar in a truck, and it does occasionally move, so... If you get a tricycle, just ask for truck bar, and they almost all know where it is. The bar is the brainchild of Tacloban native Jack Palami, who watched the destruction of his city and his family home from abroad. It just felt wrong to not come back after everything that has happened here. As someone who was born and raised in Tacloban, I just felt like I had to come back and be part of the rebuilding efforts and and make sure that I, I contribute in any way that I can. So he picked up a truck, turned it into a libaceous lorry, created a handful of jobs for the community and symbiotic opportunities for other local entrepreneurs. Not long after the truck rolled up, the kitchen popped up and the burgers are fantastic. Since Jack is one of the city's social impresarios, when I told him what I was after here, he knew just the guy. My name is Mike Ball and I'm the project director at All Hands Volunteers Project Later. All Hands was founded in 2004 by David Campbell. We started as a response organization, so a disaster would happen. We would respond, we'd find a way to help. Um, we've kind of evolved now into a response and then rebuild. So in Haiti we were there for two years, after Typhoon Sendong in Cagayan we were there for two and a half years and we're very much now a construction organization at this stage that we will be building houses, schools, whatever we can to help. I decided to spend a couple of days with all hands volunteers to see what they're doing, wait for it, 
I know, I know. But before we get to what they're building now, Mike and I are heading into the devastated no-build zone, where no NGO is allowed to work. Unlike Barangay 70, waterfront neighborhoods on the eastern side of town, the direction the storm came from, have been forbidden to rebuild. So yeah, this is the area where uh, we're within the no-build zone, so people are still living here, they're repairing here, but they can't uh, leave essentially, uh, so they can't build their houses. Um, all they can do is repair and try and kind of recover the best they can. But you're so, not allowed, no NGO is allowed to help repair? Within the no-build zone. Uh, it's a, a literally a, a no-build, so we can't go in and repair and support and help because it would encourage uh, habitation here. Um, but people aren't leaving. No. This is where they live, and why would you leave? When Yolanda hit, this was ground zero. And even now, as, as I look at this water in a calm sea, this seawall still only gives about two feet of, of free space before water would lap over this. So. Basically, a strong breeze would flood this area. Top wind speeds measured during Yolanda were the highest of any hurricane in recorded history. I mean, this is amazing. Water is coming in under the structure over here, as you see. So if the city wants to, if their plan is no more rebuilding or repairing here because we want to encourage everyone to move, yeah, I mean, it's they a massive no challenge, uh, <laughs> but there's no land, which is why the relocation is in the city. Um, there's also too many people to move, um, but it's clearly, the fear is that if another storm comes in, like Yolanda, then these homes are in the worst possible place and their lives are at risk again. And someday there will be another super typhoon, because the Philippines sits in one of the world's most storm-prone regions. Despite more than $300 million given in international aid after Yolanda, there's not money enough to build proper infrastructure along the waterfront that would allow these people to rebuild. So many have been moved into transitional shelters outside of town. That's where all hands and their partners come in. We have built three transitional sites, so in total 266 shelters um, for about 1,200 people in total. Tagporo, north of the city, is the second site All Hands and its partners built and is home to about 700 people. Everyone here is from San Jose, which was hit the hardest. Um, and they've been relocated here and they've come from conditions which may have been quite poor beforehand, before the disaster. Um, but what we tried to do here is just make sure that every person, every house has the spacing and the privacy to live, I guess, and have a decent life. So the sense that their life is back to normal and they have something which they can love and cherish and, and look after for however long they're here. And if all that seems like a lot of care for what are supposed to be temporary transitional homes, there's a reason for that. There's the potential because of the size of the disaster. Um, I mean, 1.1 million homes were damaged or destroyed, 4 million people were affected. Um, the, and the, there's very difficult to find land, so we've built this in such a way that it will last for several years. Essentially, these are here uh, to withstand whatever they need to withstand for as long as they need to be here. But it was still ruby. I mean, you've had your first test a year, a yes, year yeah. after. This is being through ruby. Ruby we hit quite hard in the north of the city. Um, the mayor actually came out the next day to look at the transitional sites and kind of publicly spoke out saying how impressed he was with all of the sites that have, um, this one and Cali in particular, the other one we built, um, which stood up and had no effects of Ruby, which is incredible. It did exactly what it was meant to do. And that's paramount because the people living here had already lost everything they had once to Yolanda, like this woman who was relocated here from San Jose. After what was happened, we don't have anything. You know, we don't have house. <laughs> we don't have house, we don't have uh, loads, uh, utensils, we don't have anything. Uh, our, uh, our house, our place is totally devastated. So Tadporo might be a dream come true, but for one little problem. We don't have work. For me, better, better before when we just lived there in Barangay San Jose because our occupation there, you know. We can build a site and we have done um, with our partners which gives people privacy and 
decency and good living conditions and has the drainage and is safe and secure and can withstand typhoons. Um, but the other side is livelihoods and kind of education and support and that is a wider issue and I think the second you start relocating people due to you know, there was no land available, it took a year for people to be relocated because it was such a tough choice for the government to make, but it still then leaves this massive gap of people looking for work and people who didn't have a job beforehand in the most case and had lost their jobs with Yolanda, but then being moved to a place uh, out of the city where there are no jobs to even look for. Um, it's a massive, massive challenge. It's one of the big challenges I think left facing this city is recovering and livelihoods and jobs and people getting their own kind of sense of, uh, sense of self back through work. The story is the same for many at Cali, one of all hands is other transitional sites. This man also came from Barangay San Jose. After it was leveled, he lived there in a tent for a year before he was relocated to Cali. Are you working right now? No. Is is that the biggest challenge living here? The biggest problem? Is yeah, that... the biggest problem. To, not for me only, for all the people here. Because uh, a lot of people here, they have worked before, they have some boat for fishing. After Yolanda's coming, gone all. Prior to Yolanda, he worked internationally, but the storm took his passport, his visa, and permits, things that in the Philippines are difficult to replace. So what's the opposite of that? What is What do you like about living here? What's good about living here? For now. For now? Here is... It's stable, it's... Yeah, yeah. Cleaner, it's drier, yeah. it's safer, it's... Safe, safe, like, safe, safe. And also, it's... What you call it? Tahimik, I don't What you call it? Tahimik? Silent. Quiet. Quiet, 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 quiet. Quiet. I'm... I you call that? Uh, I'm so happy. Mike tells me that this happy man spent days after Yolanda hit, helping pull dead bodies out of the rubble. People who are undoubtedly his friends, his neighbors. It's not all doom and gloom, though. There are livelihoods programs. There's training on here today run by the city. There's all these different small things which will happen, and NGOs are working. But essentially, you have kind of tens of thousands of people who are out of work um, looking for jobs in a city, and are now being made to, to live out of the city. Though the problems are enormous. All Hands volunteers and groups like it are making an impact. And with each project it does, the organization incorporates lessons learned from previous builds. I guess all of the little kind of afterthoughts that you can do on a site we've made sure has come in here. So the toilets are slightly bigger, the drainage is better, uh, the protection around the drainage, the, kind of the fencing all around the site. So it's kind of as safe and secure as it can be to make sure that it meets all of the international requirements, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the bits that we, it's the extra bits that make a difference. Whilst relocation is never ideal, we always, it's the last resort. Um, at least here it's been done in such a way that it's as good as it possibly can be. Because remember, these temporary shelters are probably not. This is a country with massive bureaucracy and corruption. These internally displaced people may stay that way for a long while. One of the things I'm most concerned about being here, specifically with this kind of job, is that I make sure I don't simply exploit this place and these people because there has been so much media coming through uh, since day one that um, I've talked to several locals who feel like they, they were exploited. They told me that it was it, it just seemed uh, opportunistic and these crews would show up, they would document the place and then they would split. So I've decided today to try and do my part for at least a little while and volunteer with All Hands. Since relocating people creates so many other problems, All Hands Volunteers has progressed from building transitional shelters, which displace people, to building permanent homes for those who need them most inside the city. Today, I'm joining a crew in Barangay 83C on the southeast side of town. Barangay 83C was chosen for these projects in large part because the UN uh, told all hands that this was an area where not a lot of other NGOs had a presence. 
We are currently building 20 homes in 83C uh, in situ. Uh, therefore, the beneficiaries that we identified as being the most needy. Um, all of them had properties which were essentially makeshift, uh, so they'll be demolished and then uh, the house will be built for them. This morning I've been assigned to a deconstruction crew. We are going to take this family's old hut apart and totally get rid of it so that uh, construction on their beautiful new two-story home can begin. But first the family has to move out and I believe all hands thought they had already done that so we're going to wait for a couple of minutes while uh, the family gets, uh, gets settled, gets resettled. The family of nine, two adults, seven children, have lived in this barangay for about 14 years. The shack you see today is identical to what their home was when Yolanda came through and destroyed it. Inside, half the family sleep on a raised section of flooring, and the other half sleep under it on the ground. And with that, we can get started. But as is often the case, considering the variables in these neighborhoods, progress comes in fits and starts. Some of these volunteers have professional backgrounds in construction or deconstruction. Most don't. Most are trained from scratch when they get here. And they deal with all kinds of variables. The Garado family is uh, probably one of the handful in here who has something that's this poorly constructed but has electricity. So this place is hot. And none of us have electrical degrees. We're not electricians. Uh, so we're going to have to rely on our good senses to one try and. I think whenever you get the chance and whenever you can to build in situ and to build in the community that currently exists, um, it solves so many potential problems. So you know, it addresses the issues of livelihood location and security of knowing your friends, family, of all being together. Uh, it just makes life so much easier and also takes away all of the work that needs to happen afterwards. So, you know, if you, if you relocate someone, then you have to do the follow-up and you have to try and help the livelihoods. And if you just build where they're living, where they're from, where their friends and family are, where they've lived all their lives, then um, you're taking away this massive problem uh, and you're just solving the one issue that's there, uh, which is the housing. It's always an adventure. You don't know what you're going to find when you whip something open. You rip it down and families of critters come out. Listen, if you get a thing about bugs, you get over it fast. And with the help of paid local carpenters, in about a week this will look like this. The thing that I'm very proud about with Rates 3C is that All Hands Volunteers have designed a house which will address a need, and that need is um, people who have very poor living conditions and very limited land and space and we found a way to address that exact need. And this is a design and a structure and a process that can help a lot of people. And in a month, the Garado family will have a home like this. Today is special because All Hands is handing over the first two-story home they've completed in 83C. The pilot houses in this barangay were originally single-story, but there is very little space to work on these lots. So the architects that have come in, who are also volunteers, have designed two plans, a one- and a two-story contingency. Three different architects came in as volunteers, spent a month designing the house for us. Um, it's a very kind of common story. The, if we do work in the community where we need graphic design or artists, then they're volunteers. We always try and, I guess, work within the community for the community, and, and that's including hiring local people. So the local carpenters already have the skills with the wood, the way that they work. Um, and then we use them to help train our volunteers, so the local people are kind of integral to what we can do. Like the Garado family, the Sarvitas and their five children are among the neediest in this barangay and have the smallest lot space. Oh, what does she think about the house? Mm -hmm. I think we get money. It's so very nice. It's a more safer place where they can live together with their family. philosophy is that they don't just come out and build communities, although that is certainly the most important part, but they really try to become a part of the communities. To that end, the organization encourages volunteers to develop community programs that interest them, from movie nights in the transitional settlements to play days. The organized play days like Project Sunshine on Saturday afternoons is an integral part of what they do. They build shelters six days a week, and at the end, they still choose to volunteer to do this. The volunteers have told me that doing this wears them out more than building houses. 
Your hands prize themselves on our set, essentially being so close to the community that we respond to the gaps and the holes that we see in the community. So we kind of fill in between the cracks at times from the bigger NGOs and what they're doing. They're all so much better at this than I am. scratched the surface since I've been here in Taklobon and there's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot I could stay and do. Whether the government here is going to do everything it can to take care of the problem and create solutions is up for debate. What I do know is that the non-governmental organizations here are trying very hard and they are doing very good work. If you ever meet a volunteer who does this kind of work, shake his or her hand. Very dedicated people doing very difficult work for some very deserving people. And I couldn't be more proud to have been a part of it for just a little while. The one thing that's really powerful is the desire for people to volunteer and to help. So as long as that's there and the community needs us, then we'll be there. What I can say for sure is that the Filipino people and all of the volunteers and organizations who have come here to help have a lot of heart. You need to put some pants on in man. The breeze. Ha! I did it right. <laughs>